Thank you so much for joining us today for this discussion of the world premiere musical, It Came From Outer Space. This preamble is part of the John W. and Jean M. Rowe Inquiry and Exploration Series, and we're very grateful to the Rowe family for their generous support of this program. My name is Steve Bennett. I'm one of the visiting scholars here at Chicago Shakespeare Theater. And as you probably know, and as we'll talk about more later, It Came From Outer Space was originally released as a movie back in 1953. 24 years later, in 1977, Steven Spielberg wrote and directed another movie called Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Ray Bradbury, who wrote the story on which It Came From Outer Space was based, saw Close Encounters, absolutely loved it, and even though he didn't know Spielberg, Bradbury reached out and asked if they could meet. And uh, Steven Spielberg was a little suspicious at first. He said, why do you want to meet? Bradbury said, I want to hug you and kiss you and tell you that you've made one of the great films, to which Spielberg responded, yes, please, come to my office. Uh, and when Bradbury walked in, Spielberg said, how did you like your movie? Bradbury was confused, and Spielberg said, Close Encounters is your motion picture. Why? Because I saw it came from outer space when I was a kid, and if I hadn't seen it, I wouldn't have done this film. Bradbury said later, quote, I'm so proud he said that to me. So we became friends, and Spielberg writes me letters every once in a while, and at the bottom of his letters he writes, Are you still my papa? I love that anecdote so much because it's one of many, many examples of Ray Bradbury's profound and widespread influence on contemporary culture. And obviously the musical that you're about to see is another example, and there are so many others. Um, Elton John's song Rocket Man is based on a Ray Bradbury story by the same name about a time in the future when being an astronaut is just another job like being a, a plumber or a teacher. Stephen King has said, without Ray Bradbury, there would be no Stephen King. And I found that Spielberg anecdote in a book uh, about It Came From Outer Space by Don Albright, another person like Spielberg who was so taken with the movie as a child that it became a kind of obsession and he spent years collecting the different versions of the screenplays and the story that Bradbury based the, the screenplay on, the various movie posters, collected it all into a kind of encyclopedia of all things it came from outer space. I highly recommend this book by Don Albright if you want any information about the film. Two more people who saw the movie and were inspired by it, albeit much later, are Joe Kinosian, who wrote the book and music for the musical you're about to see, and Kellen Blair, who wrote the book and lyrics. In your program, you'll see in the note from the creators that Kinosian and Blair went to a 2016 Revival House screening of the movie in glorious 3D, and they were so taken by it that at a later date, when Chicago Shakespeare's creative producer Rick Boynton contacted them and said, let's do another musical together, they immediately proposed a musical version of It Came From Outer Space. I hope to enhance your experience of the play today by exploring its artistic genealogy, giving you some information about Ray Bradbury, and then I want to introduce you to Kenosian and Blair, who created this original musical, uh, as I mentioned with creative producer Rick Boynton, and I want to explore some of the choices that director Laura Braza and her uh, creative team have made with this particular production, which is a world premiere. So let's talk about Ray Bradbury, who wrote the story that was adapted ever so slightly into the screenplay for It Came From Outer Space. Bradbury is a giant in American literature and perhaps the preeminent American science fiction writer of the 20th century. He was born in 1930, just a few miles up the road in Waukegan, Illinois. His father, Leonard, was a telephone lineman, which is interesting in light of the fact that it is a telephone lineman who is the first to encounter the aliens. 
uh, in the story and in the movie and in the play. Bradbury's family moved to Los Angeles in 1934 when his father hoped to find work at one of the movie studios. Bradbury already loved TV and the movies and that move to LA cemented his desire to write for both and to write fiction. Uh, he became incredibly prolific, publishing over 500 works over his career, including short stories, screenplays, television scripts, stage plays, and such classic books as The Martian Chronicles, Dandelion Wine, and Fahrenheit 451. When Bradbury died at age 92 in Los Angeles in 2012, he had received almost every major literary award, had sold millions and millions of copies of his work around the world, and had it, his work had been translated into 40 languages. Um, I mentioned that Knossian and Blair, who wrote the musical, were really taken by the original It Came From Outer Space. And in, in an interview, Blair says of the film, we walked away thinking there were hokey elements, but it was the height of the 2016 presidential campaign and a lot of the subject matter, particularly what Bradbury brought to the table, felt familiar and ahead of its time in terms of being a story about the fear of otherness. As I'll go into more detail about in a few minutes, this is the theme of the play that you're about to see, the fear of otherness. And the playwrights propose different responses to that fear. It's definitely worth noting that Bradbury wrote the story on which the film was based during the height of McCarthyism in the early 1950s. Bradbury was so troubled by Senator Joe McCarthy's attempts to identify shame and purge communists in Hollywood and Washington, D.C., that he took out a full-page ad in Variety in 1952 denouncing the Republican Party at the height of McCarthyism. Years later, a Freedom of Information request led to the release of the FBI's file on Bradbury. Yes, they had collected a dossier um, following him. And one of the FBI informants described how, during a discussion about whether Communist Party members should be allowed to join the Screen Actors Guild, Bradbury, quote, rose to his feet and shouted, cowards and McCarthyites, when the resolution was discussed. It's almost as if Bradbury is saying, they may be communists, but they're just people. They're not aliens. They should be allowed to join the guild. The fact that Bradbury was on the front lines of the blacklisting controversy in Hollywood during this period adds a special resonance to the It Came From Outer Space story and its theme of the fear of otherness. Sam Weller, Bradbury's biographer, describes Bradbury's response when, as an elderly man, he was handed his FBI dossier, which had been assembled years before, Quote, Bradbury beamed ear to ear and dismissed it with a wave of his hand and laughed and he said, I'll be damned. I've had nothing to hide over the years. What are they going to investigate? What a bore. End quote. Another aspect of Bradbury's work that's very relevant to the play today is Bradbury's focus on the human and on humanity. While other science fiction writers devoted their energy to imagining new space age materials or the technology to get to Mars, Bradbury was always more interested in the humans in his stories, their relationships, fears, desires, and prejudices. Critic Beatrice Cassina summed up what makes Bradbury's work stand out. In his writing, we meet people like us, human beings who cry, love, and sometimes live in doubt. We read about people who are emotionally involved in their lives and about places and times that everyone can, in some way, recognize and relate to. So this is one of the ways that the movie lends itself to being adapted into a musical. Bradbury interweaves his story of a possible contact with aliens with the very human and familiar story of two people falling in love, trying to figure out their relationship, and trying to figure out how to move forward. Obviously, a love story is a driving force of many, many musicals, and of course, many works in many other genres. In both the movie and the play, these two people are the characters John Putnam, an amateur astronomer, played in the musical by Christopher Cale Jones, 
and small town school teacher Ellen Fields, played in the musical by Jay Ladymore. The musical generally follows the plot of the movie, and both begin with Putnam and Fields stargazing one night in the small fictional desert town of Sandrock in Arizona when a comet or a meteor or an alien ship, whatever it is, it's the it in It Came From Outer Space, screams across the sky in a fiery ball and crashes in a crater in the desert. One of the things about this 1953 film that attracted Kenosian and Blair is that it was made during what is called the Golden Age of Broadway. And adapting it gave them the opportunity to write an original musical that is very much in the same vein as the musicals of that time. Um, the Golden Age of Broadway or the Golden Age of Musicals is said to have started with the musical era, uh, Oklahoma, excuse me, in 1943, considered Broadway's first blockbuster, and lasted about 20 years until The Fiddler on the Roof in 1964. Other famous musicals from this period include Annie Get Your Gun, The King and I, West Side Story, and Hello, Dolly. So you have all these very lavish, large production musicals. And the fact that the play is set in that era shaped its sound. In an interview, Kenosian says that since the story is set in the 50s, the golden age of musicals, he wanted to include that type of reassuring sound from that period. And since the story takes place in the wide open spaces and endless desert of the West, Kenosian was also listening to a lot of Aaron Copeland for inspiration. There are other ways that the play is inspired by or patterned after Golden Age musicals. So you'll remember from many of the musicals you've seen that the characters generally don't just burst into song at any time for any reason. This isn't opera after all, and that's not really fair to opera. That doesn't happen in opera. It happens more in opera than in musicals, but Golden Age musicals perfected the convention of characters transitioning from speaking to singing when emotions become too large for speech. In recent years, this convention has fallen out of favor. In a 2019 article on Backstage.com, lyricist Eric Hogginson argues that, quote, critics and audiences alike seem more and more resistant to the time-honored convention of characters bursting into song at moments of heightened emotion. And he gives some examples. So, for example, uh, the musical Hairspray winks knowingly at the convention. Mamma Mia counts on the audience recognizing the setup in advance to get laughs, and Urinetown treats it with withering, nonstop contempt all evening. Hogginson asks, is the idea of singing instead of speaking because emotional size requires it just too unhip for our postmodern age of irony? Kenosian and Blair, writers and composers of this musical, have found a way to make that convention of transitioning from speech to song as the emotional intensity rises seem very natural and appropriate by telling a story from the golden age of musicals before this convention had started to seem stale and out of date. And let me give you an example of how they've seamlessly integrated it into the story. As I mentioned, both the movie and the musical begin with the two main characters, amateur astronomer Putnam, school teacher Fields, flirting while stargazing, stargazing through Putnam's telescope as they discuss the Zodiac and their relationship. In the movie, their affectionate banter is just about to lead to a kiss when the comet, meteor, spaceship flies across the sky and interrupts them. In the play, Kenosian and Blair take it a step further. John Putnam's apparent affection for Ellen is so intense that he has already transitioned into song, a song that her emotion rises to meet. So he starts singing to her, and initially she responds in speaking, and then she sings her response, and then just as they sing the same lyrics together, their voices harmonizing in the way that the characters hope their lives soon will, John goes down on one knee in classic proposal pose, and he asks, so what do you say? Your official answer? Ellen, with a big smile on her face, my official answer is, 
and then suddenly there's a bright flash and a loud crash as something goes streaming across the sky. Ellen asks, was that a meteor? John, a meteor or something? And he jumps up and runs to investigate. So the meteor slash comet slash spaceships interrupting the marriage proposal interweaves the potential alien encounter plot with this very human love story in a way that allows these two storylines to bump up against each other and enhance each other throughout the rest of the play. Kenosian and Blair's remaking a movie into a musical is very much in line with a major trend on Broadway right now. Many contemporary musicals are based on movies, and I just glanced at Broadway in Chicago and saw, for example, there's a new musical based on the movie The Devil Wears Prada that's going to open up very soon here. On Broadway in New York right now, you can see mu musicals based on the movies Beetlejuice, the Harry Potter movies, Moulin Rouge. Broadway producer Stuart Lane says, movies have become our dime store novels. They are proven hits with a built-in audience. And if enough time has passed since the movie came out, there's also the element of nostalgia. This is obviously true for It Came From Outer Space. The very dated nature of the film is a source for comedy and fun that Kenosian and Blair mine for maximum laughs and enjoyment. Uh, Broadway producer Stewart says, one of the reasons you choose a movie on which to base a show is that the story, structure, and characters are already present. But you still have to answer the question, what will musicalizing do for the material? How will it enhance it? And as you'll see in the play, musicalizing this 50s sci-fi film enhances it in several ways. Musicalizing it is an essential element of translating the original sci-fi drama into a comedy. Kenosian and Blair are able to emphasize the humor in the story and make it resonate and echo through the songs. And musicalizing the original sci-fi drama also adds emotional color to the human love story that is the major subplot, as I said, between astronomer Putnam and schoolteacher Fields, with Sheriff Matt looking on jealously. It Came From Outer Space is the second musical that the team of creative producer Rick Boynton and Kenosian and Blair have created here at the Chicago Shakespeare Theater. The first was Murder for Two back in 2011. That musical had its world premiere here, uh, and it won the 2011 Jefferson Award for Best New Musical in Chicago, and then it went on to a very successful run off-Broadway in New York, in London, as well as successful national and international tours. Murder for Two is a musical comedy whodunit with 14 characters played by only two actors. Kenosian and Blair make a similar move and it came from outer space where there are six actors playing 12 roles, although the roles are not evenly distributed. Jonathan Butler Duplessis and Alex Goodrich, both of whom will be familiar to our audience for audiences from several earlier performances, each play three roles. Anne Delaney, who's making her debut here in the play, and Sharice Hamilton, who appeared earlier here in Pericles, each play two roles. And then the two lead actors, Christopher Kale Jones as John Putnam and Jay Ladymore as Ellen Fields, each play one character. Uh, both Murder for Two and It Came From Outer Space have 90-minute running times with no intermission. So let's talk about some of the decisions that director Laura Braza and the creative team she has assembled have made for this world premiere production. The set was created by veteran scenic designer Scott Davis, who has designed the sets for over 20 shows here at the Chicago Shakespeare Theater. Ray Bradbury has talked about how he set the story of encountering otherness in the desert because for most people, the desert is an unusual place that can seem quite otherworldly, harsh, and unforgiving. Davis gives us a desert landscape recreated in the largest and most elaborate set I've ever seen in the upstairs theater. The floors and walls are various shades of red and brown, complete with rocks and other sandstone formations typical across the southwest. The moon is prominent as it is in the desert, and the set cleverly incorporates multiple screens where projection video designers Rashawn Devonte Johnson 
and Michael Commendatori recreate the night sky in the desert where millions of stars are visible. The video projections are especially important in emphasizing the vastness of space and the alien space travel dimensions of the story. I mentioned earlier how the fact that the original film is from 1953 attracted Kenosian and Blair in part so they could use the story to write their own golden age of Broadway musical. Another thing that attracted them is the rudimentary technology slash special effects of the original film which were cutting edge in 1953 and seen quaintly outdated and simplistic from our very technologically advanced viewpoint here in 2022. You certainly don't have to watch the movie to enjoy the play, although it is fun to watch and compare. And if you see the movie, you'll see, for example, that the uh, comet, meteor, spaceship, whatever it is, is a kind of lit soccer ball with a cable clearly attached to it that, that flies across the sky. Those crude special effects are part of the earnestness, a kind of sincerity in the original film that Kenosian and Blair mine over and over here for great comic effect. What 2022 audiences see as the film's hokiness or cheesiness is a big part of why it has become a cult classic. It's so clearly from a more innocent time and place, and that hokiness becomes a, st a strong element of the comedy in the production uh, as Kenosian and Blair lean into it even more than was in the original. Look, for example, at the way they pick up the original movie's 3D magic within an actual three-dimensional space of the theater. Director Laura Braza, who's currently the Associate Artistic Director of Milwaukee Repertory Theater, enlisted the help of Manual Cinema, a Chicago performance collective, as puppetry consultants. Set designer Davis, director Braza, worked with Manual Cinema to tackle one of the thorniest issues that came up when making the movie, how to depict the aliens, especially for the first time. Now Bradbury lost a fight in the 1950s with the creative team on the movie when he insisted that the aliens would be more powerful if they were never shown and were left to the viewer's imagination. The, the director disagreed and oversaw monsters which seem to be made, and this is just my you know, unprofessional layman's description of a giant disturbing eye surrounded by smoke and cotton candy. Um, I don't have any actual information to back that up, but that's what they look like to me. For the musical, director Braza and her team decided it would fit better with the intentional hokiness of the production to really lean into the alien costumes to have fun with them, as you'll see, and Manual Cinema's contribution lays the groundwork for the introductions of the aliens themselves and is one of several innovative and surprising ways that screens and projections are woven into the production. Costume designer Mika Vanderplug had the job of dressing both the humans and the aliens, of course, and she recreates the saddle shoes and the cardigans of that skill, of that era, of that era with great skill. I've mentioned that the play has a cast of six actors transitioning quickly between 12 roles and the costumes have to enable those quick changes. The same spirit of celebrating the sci-fi efforts of the 50s while having some good-natured fun at their expense that characterizes the set also characterizes the alien costumes. All of the creative team's efforts are in the service of the play's theme which is announced in the opening song. Now the opening song is not the duet between the astronomer and the school teacher I described earlier, but in a prelude that echoes the golden age of Broadway musicals that Kenosian and Blair are paying homage to here. When the theater goes dark, you'll hear the company singing an ethereal song entitled, We Are Out There. The song suggests that the person sitting next to you in the theater may be an alien, or the person next to you in the line at the grocery store. Kenosian and Blair have explained that this tension between the familiar and the unfamiliar, the known and the unknown, between the self and the other, is perhaps the main thing that attracted them uh, to the movie. And Bradbury goes to some length in the film to point out that people seem to instinctively fear the unfamiliar, to fear what they don't understand. 
Kenosian and Blair make that theme even more prominent in the musical, adding emphasis to the fact that amateur astronomer Putnam is alien to the town of Sandy Rock, having just moved there three months before. And this subplot echoes the main plot of encountering beings who are truly other and choosing to respond with either empathy and curiosity, as some characters do, or tribalism and fear, as others do. As I mentioned, you'll hear that theme in the prelude and look for it again after we've had our own chance as an audience over the course of the play to encounter beings truly different from ourselves. Look for this theme again when the song from the prelude, We Are Out There, reappears as a reprise. Look for how the characters have changed and whether we as an audience have changed as well. Look for how Kenosian and Blair close the play and encourage us to see the other with a musically and dramatically satisfying ending that would be very much at home in a golden age of Broadway musical. Oh, and watch out for the 3D flying space rocks. Thank you. We are out there.